you for coming today. <laughs> I, I'm really excited to be here. This is a fantastic opportunity for me and I want to thank Alex for this opportunity and for to thank you all for, for coming as well. So I would also like to start off with a land acknowledgement. I'm speaking to you today from the traditional unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. I've just arrived here after uh, being out west for most of my adult life. And I'm really looking forward to sort of making connections with the local community, hearing about their activities and hopefully uh, finding ways to sort of co-develop new projects into the future. I also wanna give a to note that much of our field work, including the work that I'll be talking about today, takes place on treaty territory, specifically Treaty 7, which covers the traditional territory of the Natitsipi or Blackfoot people, and in particular, the Ghana, Pekani, and Siksika nations, as well as the Mati nation of Alberta, Region 3. So we've had a chance to get to learn about some of the ecological integrity and stewardship programs being led by Blackfoot people in Southwestern Alberta. Um, if you're interested, I, I encourage you to check out the Kepa pages of the Ghana nation where many of their projects are, are described. So I thought I'd quickly start by introducing my overall research. My students and I have worked on a variety of questions, as Alex mentioned, in ecology, evolution, and conservation, in a diversity of study systems ranging from plants to all sorts of terrestrial vertebrates. But I broadly define my research program as being interested in understanding the past, present, and future of species geographic distributions. So we currently have projects addressing the structure and history of species ranges, the ecological and evolutionary processes that give rise to geographic range limits, and the impact of global change on species distributions. But our lab byline, which you can kind of see at the bottom here, is what can we learn and how can we help? And it's the second part today that I want to talk about. So uh, we, we have a shared interest in my group in really um, making sure that we generate data that can contribute to the management and conservation of, of species. And so today I'll be telling you about one of the projects that's underway in the lab, uh, focused on our hallmark species here, the long-toed salamander. And I'm going to apologize in advance. This talk is a little bit light on results uh, for the second part, the genomic aspect, as we're still uh, analyzing our genomic data. But I want to, I'm hoping that today I can sort of give you a sense of the types of things that we're thinking about and use this opportunity to sort of stimulate conversation on conservation translocations more generally. So we're all aware that we're facing a biodiversity crisis of such a scale that some um, have proposed that we're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction in the entire history of this planet. So this is a figure from the 2022 WWF Living Planet Report showing that on average, um, there's been this sort of 69% decrease in the relative abundance of populations of more than 50,000, or sorry, 5,000 vertebrate species. And this problem has really been at the forefront of the news recently with COP15 this past December in Montreal and the adoption of a new global biodiversity framework that outlines four goals and 23 targets for halting and reversing these kinds of trends. And today I wanna to draw your attention to target four, which basically calls for management actions to halt extinction and promote the recovery of species. And in, for an increasing number of species, this is going to involve what are referred to as conservation translocations. So this is the intentional movement and release of individuals for different conservation purposes, including those that you can see here. And when we take a look at our sort of SARA listed species in Canada, we can expect the number of species for which these types of efforts are required to increase. So these are figures from Swan et al, who compiled information from 541 Sarah listed species at the time of 2016. The figure over here is showing the number of species broken down by Kosiwik status, for which conservation translocations had already been attempted as of 2016. And over here we see the number that at that time were recommended or under consideration for our are listed species. So numbers expected to go up uh, as of 2016. And um, with global change, we expect these numbers to, to go up even more quickly. So uh, this is a figure from a paper that was actually, uh, that actually came out earlier this month, some really neat results examining connectivity between protected areas across the globe that serve as each other's climate analogs under two degrees warming. 
And the authors found that 58% of protected areas around the world, including 35% here in Canada, demonstrate what they're calling uh, climate connectivity failure. And so this is defined as very large distances between the analog, the climate analogs of a given protected area and that protected area, heavy hum human modification of the sort of intervening habitats that will restrict dispersal for many species, um, or inhospitable cl climatic conditions under, under global change en route from a, a particular protected area and its closest climate analogs. So assuming that protected areas are gonna to continue to play an important role in the protection of species, we're faced with this kind of increasing need to move things around as climate changes. And this is especially true for things that have very limited uh, vigility um, or that are highly sensitive to changes in environmental conditions, including a group that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, the amphibians. So today I want to talk about work that my lab is doing to support a specific translocation effort, in this case a reintroduction, for long-toed salamanders in protected areas in southwestern Alberta. And this is work that we're doing with support from and in collaboration with Parks Canada. So just briefly to introduce you to the salamanders, long-toed salamanders are uh, one of the most widely distributed amphibians in western North America. You can see that they occur in quite a variety of habitats, and they're actually quite common throughout most of this range. So at first glance, this species doesn't appear to be particularly interesting from a conservation perspective. Here in Canada, it's not listed by Kosiwik, and so why would we be focused on this species? Well, when we take a closer look, we observe notable morphological variation across the range of this species, especially with respect to uh, the stripe pattern. And this sort of phenotypic variation has led to the designation of five subspecies, as you can see here. And in some jurisdictions, there's a reason to be concerned about the status of these different subspecies. So most notably, down here in California, the Santa Cruz long-toed salamander is federally and state listed as an endangered species. It has a highly restricted distribution in California with as few as 24 uh, known breeding populations remaining in the wild. Now, when taxa get to this level of threatened, any event that impacts populations can be catastrophic. So in 2019, a trematode outbreak caused mass mortality um, in, in California and put 10,000 breeding adults at risk in a wildlife refuge, which supports two of the 24 remaining populations of this, this subspecies. And state agencies in the past have had to do things like conduct emergency salvages of, of populations in extreme drought years, which as we all know in California, we're expecting more of those. So ideally we mitigate against population declines before things get to this level of, of being at risk. So let's go now to a different jurisdiction where the long-toed salamanders are of conservation concern, but where the situation is much less dire. So this is the distribution of the long-toed salamander in Alberta. And this, the subspecies that is uh, officially recognized here is the Eastern long-toed salamander, which is uh, listed as in the province as being of special concern. And this is in part because of its sort of narrow distribution along the Rocky Mountains in the province, as well as its sort of patchy distribution. And there's some recent uh, reports coming out of work by a graduate student uh, at the University of Calgary that the species is, is still declining in parts of its range. So one of the sort of biggest threats that the salamanders and other amphibians face in the province has been the uh, introduction of non-native fish into fish-free aquatic habitats for recreation purposes. So this is a map uh, that one of my graduate students put together. It shows all publicly available data on historically stocked water bodies in the province. And this gives you a sense of just how extensive this fish stocking has been and continues to be in Alberta. And notably, there was a history of fish stocking in protected areas in the province as well, including our Rocky Mountain National Parks, which harbor a large uh, proportion of the long toed salamanders in the province. So here are a few historic photos. This is a fish hatchery um, that was down in Waterton at one point, and one of the sort of high elevation lakes where these non-native fish were introduced in the 1920s. 
Now fish stocking has ceased in the national parks, but these introduced populations of fish persist and are still causing a number of ecological problems, including for native fish. I actually was at this site uh, last summer and there was a sort of a log just offshore in the water and there were all these Columbia spotted frog tadpoles like trying to get cover and protection under this one log, but it, you know, it was pretty dire for them. In terms of their impacts on salamanders, uh, the introduction of these fish uh, in these high elevation lakes has been devastating and has actually led to the extirpation of populations across much of their range um, reintroduction program in this part of the country. In the last couple of years, there has been some success reintroducing leopard frogs uh, to the park, which is down here, as well as uh, surrounding areas that um, were part of the species sort of historic range. But the success has really come on um, on the heels of several failed attempts by the park and others in this area to reintroduce leopard frogs. And in BC and just across the way, um, there's been sort of thousands and thousands of dollars spent trying to get new populations of the uh, endangered Rocky Mountain population to sort of take off um, with, with limited success to date. Now I'm using the leopard frogs as an example to highlight that published accounts of amphibian reintroductions suggest that we fail up to 40% of the time. And this is at great cost to sort of our resources as well as our time. And so this has caused, caused, uh, led to calls for greater planning and consideration of different types of data that might be able to inform these efforts um, and help bolster success. And so this is something my lab has been thinking about, and specifically students in my group are generating species distribution models and collecting genomic data to inform two pre-release decisions when it comes to the salamanders. So the first question we have is, uh, of the sites under consideration, which should we prioritize for the reintroductions, and then which populations should we uh, use as our sources? So to answer the first question, we are exploring the use of species distribution models um, to help evaluate these uh, alternative release sites. Now, I believe many of you will be familiar with these types of models, but just briefly, the idea here is that we can use records of where a species has been found to extract information from GIS data sets about the set of environmental conditions that underlie presence on the landscape. We, with this information, we can then generate a model that differentiates these conditions from either background conditions or, or conditions where the species is known to be absent. And we can, we can use this model to predict probability of occurrence or habitat suitability. So here I'm showing uh, probability of occurrence in relation to temperature, but I'll note that these models are usually operating in multivariate environmental space. So we can then project our models back across space to get a, a, a to get a sense of where conditions are likely to be suitable for species, and we can start to explore relative, relative differences in the relative uh, predicted suitability of sites across species ranges. And there's been some indication that these types of correlative models may be useful for selecting um, among potential release sites in translocation programs. So uh, these are results from a fairly recent study by Bellis et al, where they looked, they took a post hoc look at predictors of translocation success in amphibians, reptiles, and insects. And they found that not only was there this kind of positive association between SEM uh, predicted climatic suitability and the probability of translocation success, but that predicted climatic suitability from these models explained a whopping 48% of the variation in translocation outcome. So that's pretty promising. But I'll point out that these models are used um, very widely in ecology and conservation biology for a number of different purposes. And before I get into the models that we're specifically generating for the salamanders in Alberta, I'd like to tell you about some results from a recent review that colleagues and I conducted scrutinizing the performance of these models more generally. <clears throat> In particular, um, in contrast to the Bellis et al. study, there's some indication from the literature that we often overestimate the accuracy and thus the ultimate utility of these models. So this is a figure from Newbalt et al. where they looked at the commonly used model evaluation metric, AUC, or area under the receiver operating curve for models generated for 34 species of Egyptian reptile, amphibians, butterflies, and mammals. And they compared sort of this evaluation metric um, when AUC was based on withheld data from the input localities that were used to build the model. And this is how most models are evaluated. 
to AUC based on presence absence data from independent field surveys. And the first thing to note is that AUC scores based on this sort of internal validation is, are often higher than scores based on independent data. So this is the one-to-one -one line that you can see, and most of our points are falling above this line. Now, an AUC score of 0.7 or higher is uh, typically used in the literature as the cutoff for uh, considering a model to be useful. And the second thing to note is that we're often in the situation where our models pass internal validation, so AUC above 0.7 on the y-axis here, but fail to sort of uh, pass external validation with independent data. And so this got me wondering, how common is this kind of situation where we pass a model that we shouldn't have passed if the goal is to say something about new populations and real populations on the landscape? And so I got together with colleagues Jenny McCune, Seema Seth, and Sam Piernon to review the literature to answer this question. How often do SDMs per accurately predict independent data about population? <coughs> And so we conducted an extensive multi-staged, oh, sorry, I'm gonna cough again. <laughs> um, we conducted an extensive multi-stage web of science search for studies comparing <clears throat> model predictions from SDMs <clears throat> to independent data on occurrence, abundance, population growth rates, and genetic diversity. Now, I won't get into details of our search criteria. I want to jump <laughs> straight to what we found. And the very first thing that I'll note um, is that um, these models are vastly untested in the literature. So a general search using our, our search criteria, but excluding our terms that were meant to pull out um, studies with independent data, returned about 21,000 studies using SDMs for one purpose or another. Of these, about 1,800 seem promising with respect to independent validation. <clears throat> but of these 1,800 studies, only 201 actually validated models with independent data. Now, the actual numbers here aren't as important as the sort of magnitude of use of these models in the literature versus true tests of the accuracy of these models. And when we take a look at the 201 studies that tested SDM predictions with independent data across the board, these models often fail <coughs> to predict it, independent data about populations. So only about half of the studies testing the ability of SDMs to predict independent occurrence found unambiguous support for the use of these models to do so. And the ability of these models to predict other things um, was even lower. And for things like genetic diversity, which are only really indirectly related to, to occurrence in sort of population biology theory, the results were quite dismal. So in the paper, we discussed sort of practical and theor theoretical reasons as to why these models may often fail. And I'm happy to chat about that with anyone who's interested later. But the main points I wanna press, impress upon you today is that care is needed when we're using these models for predictive purposes, including for many conservation applications. And secondly, model evaluation with independent data is essential. We can't simply take a model like this at face value without this step as these models often get it wrong. Um, and so you may wonder, well, why bother with these models at all? Um, the answer is, unfortunately for many species, these SDMs remain one of the sort of most available tools for some of the questions that, that we have. And so on the heels of this review, graduate student Kagan Finn set out to explore the potential use of SDMs to help prioritize sites for salamander reintroductions in Alberta. Now, one thing we didn't do in that review, but we noted was important to think about, is the impact of different modeling decisions when generating these models. And so Kagan has done a deep dive into the question of how certain decisions around model inputs impact both model predictions, as well as the accuracy when it comes to independent data on the salamanders. So Kagan specifically generated a series of Maxent models. So this is one of the more common ways to generate an SDM using um, different subsets of available long-toed salamander locality records from GBIF and different government databases. And he varied sort of three model inputs that are thought to be important when generating these models. 
So first he explored uh, the impacts of the different types of variables that were used in the models. The most common uh, variables that are used in the SDM literature are these broad scale climatic variables, but others have argued that it may be important to include non-climatic variables and variables that capture the biotic environment when generating SDMs. The second modeling decision that Kagan considered was the type of background points used in the model. So typical use of Maxent when generating presence only models is to have the models compare conditions where a species has been observed to be present, so these orange dots here, to sort of randomly selected background points across your study area, these blue points here. <clears throat> but one problem here is that the distribution of observed uh, locality records for many species is often biased to easily accessible areas, including along roads or around um, cities. And this sampling bias is not, is not matched when um, selecting random background points. And this can lead to models tending to predict greater suitability along roads simply because of the difference in this sampling bias. So several studies have suggested the use of what are referred to as target group background points as an alternative. And here, um, <clears throat> the idea is to use records of uh, other species in the same taxonomic group that are surveyed in similar ways. And the assumption is that people who are out and about looking for a particular, say, amphibian species will tend to report other amphibian species that they encounter, making it possible to say something about the niche of our specific focal species relative to conditions where amphibians have been um, surveyed more generally. And finally, Kagan tested the impacts of different study extents on our models. So the spatial extent, this is the spatial extent from which our locality and background data are coming from. He generated a range-wide model, um, as well as an ecoregion model that sort of uh, encompasses the ecoregion of where our target uh, conservation application is located, a subspecies extent reflecting what we know about the genetic boundaries of uh, the salamanders that occur in this region, and a political extent corresponding to provincial land divisions. As you And you might imagine that while a range-wide extent sort of speaks to the full set of conditions that the species as a whole can tolerate, these other extents may be more useful if we have local adaptation or if conditions at the edge of the range are, are very different from what um, is sort of experienced across the, the wider range. Okay, so with two sets of input variables, two types of background points, and four possible study extents, Kagan ended up generating 16 models in total. And here are these models projected across southwestern Alberta in and around our target area of interest, which is down here in the, in the sort of southwestern uh, corner. Warmer colors in these maps indicate areas where a model is predicting higher suitability. And you can see just by looking at these maps that there is this sort of substantial variation um, or differences between our models in, in sort of what they're predicting to be suitable or not. Here I'm showing the result, uh, applying a threshold method to convert those continuous model predictions into binary surfaces of habitat suitability for the four models that were based on climate only variables and random background points, but that varied sort of the, the study extent. And this sort of helps to highlight some really dramatic differences that we can observe depending on even just a single modeling decision. So for the range-wide model here, for example, we have low predicted suitability uh, kind of uh, in the western part of our, um, of our study area and high predicted suitability is shown in yellow in the eastern part of our, sub our study area, but our political extent makes almost the complete uh, opposite set of direction um, of predictions. Sorry. So this really highlights the impact of these different modeling decisions on, on the model prediction end of things. But ultimately we wanna know if any of our models can actually do a good job at predicting independent data. And so this is what Kagan did next. So he conducted sort of an extensive field survey last summer visiting sites in Southwestern Alberta that spanned uh, the full range of predicted suitability from his models. And here you can see him kind of pulling no punches to access these sites. So this wasn't your typical sort of average roadside sampling. Um, when he got to sites, he used basic visual and dip nets uh, surveys, which we found to be um, pretty effective in this region, given the conspicuous nature of the larva and uh, the sort of high water clarity in this part of the species range. 
And in total, he managed to visit uh, 83 sites and score these sites for presence absence. And these were previously unsurveyed sites in the province. So he not only managed to generate a data set that could be used to test his models, but is also uh, in the process filling gaps in our understanding of the distribution of this species in the province. Okay, so what do we expect from a model that can accurately predict independent presence absence data? I've already told you about AUC and noted that a cutoff of 0.7 is typically used to consider a model as being acceptable. A perhaps more intuitive uh, way to think about this is that we might expect that the average predicted suitability of our survey sites where the species was found to be present would be significantly higher than at sites where the species was absent. Now, both of these methods are an indication of what's referred to as the discrimination performance of models. Okay, so this is the ability of the models to uh, distinguish presences from absences on average. But a less appreciated measure of performance that's, that's not often reported in the literature is what's, what's called the calibration performance. And so this is simply whether the model, uh, whether the probability of occurrence uh, in our independent survey is positively and linearly related to our predicted habitat suitability. And unless we can demonstrate this kind of relationship, we really can't be using these models to actually rank sites for a given application of interest, which is often what we want to do and definitely what we want to do in this case. Okay, so how did Kagan's models fare when we when we test them against these different measures of, of performance? This is a big table and I apologize for that in this and what he's got in this table is essentially all the 16 models that he generated the model settings and then these different measures of performance where you see bolded values, <clears throat> the model passes the evaluation metric. And sort of right off the bat, <clears throat> the first thing that we see is that about half of his models failed to pass one or more of these evaluation metrics. <clears throat> and there are some interesting things to note with respect to how the different um, modeling decisions impacted these results. So first, all models generated with a political study extent passed at least one measure of accuracy, regardless of the other two studying, study settings. Um, in contrast, models that were generated with sort of genetic subspecies in mind uh, failed to pass model evaluation no matter what you did. Now, in terms of uh, the range wide extent and the ecoregion extent, you can see that we can sometimes build a model that passes depending on the, the other two settings that were considered. In terms of background points, despite recent calls to use target group background points, Keg, for Kagan's models at least, the models tended to do better if you used random uh, background points. And finally, in terms of the variables considered, somewhat surprisingly, given sort of the emphasis on moving beyond climate only models, we really found that this decision didn't have much of an impact. You could build a good model with climate only variables um, as long as you carefully set the other two settings. So all of this is to say that model settings can have kind of this huge impact on both model predictions, as I've shown you, as well as uh, a model's ability to accurately uh, predict things about new populations. Keyword that I'm using there is careful. Uh, we learned from this study that model settings matter a lot, emphasizing the need for these types of extensive sensitivity tests. And notably, Kagan found that modeling approaches that are generally touted as best practices in the literature do not always lead to an accurate model. So there really is no one size fits all. And I, I, I strongly discourage the sort of black box use of these models that um, has become common in ecology. Now, in this case, we were able to generate an SDM that could predict independent presence absence, but I'll note that this was not the case for other amphibians in the province. So I, an undergrad thesis student in the lab uh, took a look at, this, at a similar question for about five other species in the province. And, and for several of them, we weren't able to successfully generate an accurate SDM. In general, we might expect that it won't always be possible to generate an accurate SDM when we're working with things at the edge of their range. And this is simply because issues with dispersal or novel biotic conditions at the edge of the range may mean that species are excluded from suitable habitat at, in, at the periphery of their range, limiting our ability to use uh, observed locality data to say anything about the niche really. <clears throat> 
And this is a topic of a meta-analysis that Kagan and I are, are currently working on. And I think this has a lot of implications for the use of SDMs in Canada, especially because many of our, our species here are at the, the edge of their range. But more critically, as I noted earlier, models often do poorly when predicting anything other than occurrence. And so while Kagan's study and others suggest that SDMs hold some pro promise for conservation planning, we really do need sort of post-release monitoring and more tests of the ability of these models to predict translocation success. Okay, I'm gonna turn now to talk about a different set of projects in the lab that are making use of genomic data to enforce inform uh, the selection of source populations for this reintroduction. So the 2021 IUCN guidelines for reintroductions and other conservation translocations list several genetic considerations when planning a reintroduction. And the genomic data that we're collecting for the salamanders will speak to four of these recommendations. So first, in line with the recommendation that founders should show characteristics based on genetic provenance with sort of the original or remaining populations in the area, we're using genomic data to assess how far away from our target um, reintroduction sites our conservation partners can go before they end up introducing a completely different evolutionary lineage into the area. And second, in line with recommendations um, that individuals should be sourced from populations with appropriate demographic genetic welfare, and that founder selection should aim to provide adequate genetic diversity. We're using genomic data to compare estimates of genetic variation and effective population size across potential uh, source populations. <clears throat> and finally, in line with recommendations to consider adaptive diversity, we're asking whether there are genetic differences among populations at high and low elevation sites that may signal local adaptation, and combining this information with spatial data to assess which, which genotypes might do best in uh, that area under future climatic conditions. So I mentioned at the start of my talk that we're still in early stages of this analysis. So I'm, I'm only gonna show you some preliminary results today that speak to this first consideration. And I'll be resurrecting some of my older PhD work to show you here, um, but hopefully this will give you kind of a sense of why I think this line of investigation is important. So thinking about genetic prominence, let's take another look at the described distributions of the different long-toed salamander subspecies. This map would suggest that, for instance, Waterton could source individuals from anywhere in Alberta, including in, in Jasper and Banff, if need be, and, and still be working with individuals from the eastern long-toed salamander. Now, this is great from an administrative perspective because it's easier to do these sorts of uh, projects within government organizations and jurisdictional boundaries than it is to work across uh, institutions or borders. However, these boundaries were drawn based on morphological data and a limited number of specimens. And as a PhD student, I was very interested in verifying whether long-toed salamander subspecies are actually distinct genetic lineages and if so, clarifying the boundaries between these groups. So I collected both mitochondrial sequence data and nuclear SNP data, and I was able to show that, yes, these are pr pretty distinct genetic groups. So at the top here, <clears throat> I'm showing uh, mitochondrial haplotype networks with the different colored circles in this case, representing haplotypes collected from each of the subspecies. And these are, are divergent enough groups that um, the different uh, networks for the subspecies couldn't be connected within the limits of statistical parsimony. And um, simple clustering methods, including the multi-dimensional scaling analysis that you see down here, also separates these groups in terms of variation across the nuclear genome. But what was really striking to me as a student was that previous descriptions of the ranges of the different subspecies were not entirely supported by the genetic data. So <clears throat> here's our subspecies map again. This time the colored symbols indicate sort of mitochondrial clade membership, uh, whereas the shading is indicating AFLP group membership. And a couple of things might jump out at you. So first down here in Southern Oregon, we have this completely undescribed lineage. So the subspecies boundaries as shown by these kind of dashed lines here, fail to sort of capture the full complement of diversity in this group in the first place. And second, the boundaries in many places really need redrawing, including over here in Alberta, where 
rather than having a single subspecies, we actually have two subspecies. Um, with the eastern long-toed salamander being much more restricted in the province and in Canada more generally than what our sort of current subspecies maps would, <clears throat> would suggest. So my earlier work suggests uh, that we're much more limited uh, in our ability to source populations from within Canada uh, for this reintroduction here, assuming that we wish to stay within sort of the evolutionary lineage that's present, that's present in um, this part of the province. But there was still some uncertainty over the exact boundary between sort of the groups in, in Alberta here. So you can see up here in Banff and Kananaskis, um, there's some indication of there being admixed individuals. And so uh, at this juncture, we kind of need a more precise answer to how far away can we go from our area of interest and still recover the same lineage. So this is a question that um, a former postdoc in the lab, Dr. Arianna Kuhn, is continuing to work on alongside collaborator, Dr. David Weisrock. So we've managed to now sequence over a thousand long-toed salamander tissue samples from our 4,000 sample collection. Um, and we're using sort of reduced representation sequencing, in this case, ddrad seq. And depending on the subset of uh, samples that we're including in our different assemblies and on our filtering strategies, we're getting upwards of 35 SNPs from 35,000 SNPs from across the genome with this effort. And I'll just note that this isn't all going into this question. There, the, this data set is um, being used for several projects in the lab, ranging from phylogeographic scales down to very fine temporal population genomics questions. And so here's a, a first look at the, what the genomic data are, are telling us in terms of lineage boundaries. So this is a quick PCA plot that we that Ariana um, generated this week, um, and it's showing representative individuals from the different subspecies, as well as additional number of individuals from um, the area surrounding our target area of interest. Now the colors on this in this plot don't really mean anything. So I will uh, walk you through how our different genetic groups are falling out. So first we have these three groups separating along PC1 and PC2. And up, up here in this red group, we really have individuals from California, Washington, and Oregon. Um, so the sort of three most Western subspecies. <clears throat> in this green group here, we have representatives from um, sort of Northern BC, including Jasper National Park is in central Washington. And this yellow group here represents individuals from South Western Alberta, Southeastern BC, uh, as well as Montana. So here's where our populations from Waterton are falling out as we expect. And I'll note this group here, this is, uh, this is where Banff National Park, so our closest Rocky Mountain National Park is falling out once again, with the genomic data indicating that we have some sort of admixture going on between at least two of the lineages in this region. And I just wanna take a minute to uh, point out what appears to be a real gap in the species distribution in Alberta. So this red square here is highlighting the highwood watershed and we haven't found um, any, any salamanders in this watershed. To the north of this gap is where we have these sort of admixed individuals, if you will. And to the south is where this sort of yellow group is falling out. And, um, and so it seems like for the reintroduction, we can go as far north, but not further north uh, than, than this gap, the bottom edge of this gap, if we want to source individuals from within Alberta and stay within the uh, yellow lineage. And incidentally, thinking about sort of the biogeographic history of this group, our working hypothesis is that because there's sort of a steep mountain wall here uh, and very high mountain elevation passes here, that these sort of hybrids in, in, in the Banff, uh, Kananaskis area are actually resulting from an entirely separate northward kind of expansion of the yellow lineage um, on the BC side of things, rather than uh, coming up through uh, Southern Alberta there. And that's something that we can, that we hope to explore with our phylogenomic data. Okay, so a question that some might be asking is, does this really matter? If the goal is to have salamanders at a site, won't any old salamander do? <laughs> and I think there's really uh, two ways to think about this. So on the one hand, perhaps this is a value-based question. We might care about maintaining genetic, the in genetic integrity of distinct groups within a species simply because we value this diversity, or perhaps not. 
On the other hand, there can be some practical implications here. So hybridization uh, of introduced individuals with existing individuals in an area has the potential to undermine our conservation goals if there is any sort of outbreeding depression or genetic incompatibilities between groups. And for groups as seemingly different as our salamander lineages, it may be important to remember what we've learned from the hybridization literature. So one possibility when populations undergo divergence is that they can become reproductively isolated through the development of genetic incompatibilities. And the basic idea here is that we might have an ancestral population with two genes whose products interact, but if this ancestral population splits into two populations that undergo a period of isolation, say for example in different glacial refugia, there can be genetic changes at one or, uh, or both of these genes in the different populations. And while co-evolution within populations will ensure that these sort of gene products continue to work well together in their respective populations, um, if we bring different alleles from the two populations into a hybrid, their respective gene products may no longer work very well together. So one of the things that I was interested in as a PhD student was whether there might be genetic incompatibilities of this sort in long-toed salamanders, specifically involving mitochondrial and nuclear genes, so cytonuclear incompatibilities. And so uh, just west of uh, Banff over here, uh, this is Yoho National Park in vicinity, we have individuals that carry the eastern mitochondrial genome, as you can see in the yellow bars up here. Um, but where they're, with respect to their nuclear genome, they're sort of belonging to this more central green lineage. So this is a structure plot. Each bar represents an individual with the height of the different colored bars in the bar, indicating the proportion of, in, of that individual's ancestry that belongs to either the green lineage or the yellow lineage. And so what we have here is this kind of natural opportunity to test whether individuals that have these kind of mismatches between their mitochondrial genome and their nuclear genome show any evidence of cytonuclear incompatibilities. And so we brought sort of adult salamanders with different cytonuclear genotypes uh, to the lab to test their performance in a common garden. And we were specifically looking at their feeding performance in terms of mass conversion efficiency during the summer feeding period. And we looked at this because uh, the ability of, of salamander individuals to bulk up during the summer months has been shown to impact the amount of resources that individuals have for reproduction the following spring um, and subsequently their reproductive success. And we found differences among the groups of salamanders from different parts of this transect in terms of feeding performance. In particular, Individuals from uh, western, the western edge of our transect over here, where individuals were not mismatched in terms of their mitochondria and nuclear genomes, tended to have higher feeding performance than individuals from sort of the eastern moor ponds that were mismatched in terms of their mitochondria and nuclear genome. Now, the story is much more complex than this. As you move further east into Banff again, there seems to be some recovery of feeding performance. Um, and there's also this sort of co additional co-integration of uh, additional nuclear genes with the mitochondrial genome. So there's a lot more to do to sort of assess uh, these cytonuclear incompatibilities and genetic incompatibilities more generally in these different salamander lineages. But I think these results are at least suggestive in this regard and highlight that, that caution is needed when moving individuals across genetic boundaries because there can be these sorts of negative outcomes uh, for populations if there's hybridization. Okay, so I'll wrap up there. Alex, I'm not sure how much time, where I am, what time I, <laughs> I didn't start uh, tracking it, so I apologize. <laughs> but I, I don't have sort of a summary for the genomic work as of yet, but I would like to end with some uh, parting thoughts more generally. So first I wanna note that the careful development of SDMs and the collection of genomic data, this is really slow work. And given the pace of biodiversity loss, the question becomes, can we speed it up at all? And I think our work sort of underscores the, the, the value of very basic data on the distribution and diversity of populations. So SDMs rely on having a sufficient number of locality records to ge generate accurate models. And so we need to address kind of data deficiencies in terms of our understanding of where species are on the landscape. And for many species in Canada, we also lack even a very basic understanding of genetic structure across the range. This is particularly true for amphibians where everybody seems to have stopped sampling at the US-Canada border. Um, so this is something that also needs more attention. 
The second thing that I'll point out is that I've been speaking about the pre-release end of things, but I want to emphasize that we really need a better understanding of different factors uh, that are influencing translocation success. Now, there have been a few sort of recent reviews on in the literature on this question, but it's clear from these studies that details about the decisions made during different translocation efforts are, are really hard to find. They're either in the gray literature or completely missing. Um, and so it, this makes it really hard to kind of evaluate predictors of translocation success in this regard. And, and what I think we need then is to de develop some sort of standardized system for documenting the kind of design of these different translocation efforts and what, uh, what uh, planning steps were considered. And finally, in order to uh, truly improve translocation programs, we need post-release monitoring and specific tests of whether things like predicted suitability of sites or levels of genetic variation of source populations do indeed predict translocation outcomes. Um, these sorts of experimental uh, tests uh, won't be possible with many of our most imperiled species where we may be down to a single population that we don't want to remove too many individuals from and which has uh, the genetic diversity that it has so no room to test no room to play around there but for something like the salamanders where we are still a in this sort of position where we have the luxury of multiple potential source populations, there may be some scope to design field-based tests of the extent to which these types of pre-planning decisions really matter. And I think results from these tests would, um, would, would be useful and open the door more generally, informing when and where we might expect translocations to be effective and worthwhile versus not. And so with that, I want to just end by thanking uh, the amazing group of students that I've had a chance to work with. Um, I count myself really lucky to have worked with with these people. Uh, we not only made it through COVID lockdowns and delays, uh, but we also, the students have also had to weather sort of a building flood, a six week strike uh, and lockout at Lethbridge and more recently my move from Alberta to Ontario. And I like to show these photos because I think they capture that despite all this, there's still quite a lot of energy and spirit in the lab. So at the top here, the students are out with um, ecologists from Alberta environments uh, and parks and from Parks Canada. And we're just looking at amphibians and, and looking, learning about things that are going on on the land. Um, down here, we're out looking for spade foot toads just for fun. And this photo is uh, one of the photos from our lab retreat. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening.